the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our Lord says, He that wishes to come after me, let him renounce himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And St. Thomas Aquinas says, In there you have the summary of the three great vows that religious will make, monks and nuns. And that is, let him... You who wishes to come after me, let him renounce himself, sell all he has, and follow me. Renounce himself, that's the, the vow of chastity. The vow of chastity, self-denial to the legitimate pleasures that belong to the holiness of marriage. Uh, to embrace the consecrated life, to consecrate oneself with Christ on the cross as a monk or a nun or a brother or a priest and sacrifice one's life like a chalice with Christ on the cross. And then that's the vow of chastity. Second, sell all he has. Sell all he has. Give it to the poor and follow. That's the vow of poverty, obviously. And the Franciscans, who are the brown robes, who will flood into Florida in 1574 to 1606 and on, they will be uh, doing much work and many of them will be martyred. So the vow of poverty, chastity, poverty, and then Christ says, follow me, obedience, follow me. So th th these great vows, even though the priests of the Society of St. Pius X don't make the vow of poverty and obedience, we're supposed to have that spirit in us. And even the people in the world, even though they don't make vows, married people, they should always have that spirit of poverty, chastity, obedience. And there were, there were saints who were kings and queens and had a lot of wealth, like St. Charles Borromeo. And he had the spirit of poverty, which was, he used his, his wealth for much good. He built hospitals throughout the city of Milan and orphanages and supported the monasteries and schools, for example. So that spirit of poverty means also take care of the things that we have and not be wasteful. And then uh, the spirit of chastity, of course, is purity. And we have a great model in St. Maria Goretti. St. Maria Goretti, in uh, the early 1900s, she was a young saintly girl. She was only... Uh, I think 11 or 12 years old, when the 17-year-old Alexandro uh, approached her to sin. And she said, like Joseph of the Old Testament, how can we do this before God, who sees all? Alexandro, you'll go to hell for this. And he was too blinded by lust. He had been, um, he had been taking time, going into the town, looking at some of the dirty pictures in the town and so that lust was fueled and fired up in him and he didn't pray he didn't go to confession he didn't fight it he just completely gave in and he was blinded by lust and he attacked her with uh, an ice pick or kind of a rusty ice pick and he stabbed her 14 times and she she didn't die instantly she suffered all night long she couldn't drink any water, she bled a lot, she was really thirsty. So in her little life she kind of uh, showed the, the life of our Lord in His Passion. She was greatly thirsty, she suffered all night long, they had to do surgery in her to clean out what they could of the wounds, but the, the depth of the wounds punctured into the lungs, into the internal organs, so there was no way to save her. And by morning, she said, I forgive Alexandro. Like Christ forgave on the cross, she forgave Alexandro. And she died with the, all the sacraments. And she died a martyr of purity and chastity. And her soul went straight to heaven. Alexandro, meanwhile, was arrested and put in prison for 30 years. He was released on good behavior. Because after about 30 years, it took him a long time. For all the time, he was denying it, saying it was Maria's fault. He was blaming Maria. 
And finally, in one of his dreams in the prison, Saint Maria Goretti appeared to him with 14 lilies of forgiveness, with a smiling. And she, when, she, when she died, she said, I hope Alexander will be with me in heaven. And indeed, his life changed. He went to confession. He really converted. And he, on a good behavior, he was released. And he kind of became like a lay brother. And the first thing he did when he left the prison was find the mother of St. Maria Goretti. Her name was Asunta. And he knocked at the door of the rectory because she was working as, as a house cleaner and preparing meals for the priests in her town. And the Asunta answered the door and she saw Alexandro. And he said to her, do you know who I am? She said, yes, I do. You're Alexandro. You, you killed my daughter. And he said, do you forgive me? And the Asunta said, Maria forgives you, I forgive you. And he, they embraced in uh, forgiveness and true friendship, virtuous friendship. And in fact, Alexandro would be sitting next to Asunta at the beatification of St. Maria Goretti in St. Peter's Basilica. So they would sit there when the Pope proclaimed her blessed. And in those days when Rome canonized or beatified saints, it was the whole place was decorated beautifully. But Alexandro was still alive for her canonization, but he wouldn't go because he got a lot of threats from the Mafia and the Italians. Don't, don't even be seen in Rome for her canonization. Uh, Assunta forgave him, but not the Italians. And <laughs> he didn't go to the canonization because they would have killed him for sure. But he certainly prayed to her, and he, he, ended, up, he ended up dying a good and holy death. So that's the vow of chastity. And even though Maria didn't make the vow of chastity, she certainly had that spirit of chastity. And this is something under serious attack in our time. The Virgin Mary said that purity will hardly be known in our days. And the fashions will be introduced, says Jacinta of Fatima, fashions will be introduced that will offend our Lord very much. And let alone the fashions, just the the availability of the garbage, immoral garbage on internet at any access, any time is extremely, extremely dangerous to the soul. And it's a billion dollar business. And here the high Masonic Jews are laughing while the, the Goyim just swallow up all this mud and decay and rot in their souls and are plunging to hell because of so much immorality being pushed. Being pushed in the public school system, being pushed through pornography, being pushed through the advertisements, the movies, and fornication is seen as completely normal today. That's how godless and, and turned away from God's laws we have become as a Western people. Completely corrupt. And that's partly why the Muslims didn't want democracy. They didn't want the Western way of the world because they didn't want uh, dance clubs and these corrupt <coughs> movies and the Western rock and roll filthy music. They didn't want that. And that's why they stood against it. Not that the, mo not that the Muslims are models of virtue, but they at least had some natural virtue to not want this garbage in their countries under Saddam Hussein, for example. And he was the one obstacle blocking the flood of the Western corruption. So they had to get rid of him, and they did. They found him through his cell phone, where he was hiding. They found him through the cell phone. And, uh, and now they got all the Western corruption, taking many, many souls to hell. So you boys, we, we all have to fight. Yeah? We have to pray to the Virgin Mary for this great love of God, a purity in the faith, not compromising, not not falling to sedevacantism and not falling to false compromise on the right or on the left. As Archbishop Lefebvre used to say, ni modernist ni schismatique. We are neither modernist 
nor schismatic or sede vacantes. We just take Catholic. So, let's look at another group of martyrs very briefly. Today we're going to go to Jacksonville. We're going to see, uh, we're going to walk up on a little hill and it's where Father Martinez was martyred and clubbed to death. We're going to stand there today and pray uh, today up in Jacksonville. But by 1574, so this is nine years after the first Mass in Florida and the establishment with Father Lopez, um, 1574 to 1606, the Franciscans were being more and more sent by the King Philip II in Spain. And if any of you want to read a powerful history book, it's Philip II by William Thomas Walsh. Maybe you can settle that as one of your history for one of your homeschool history for one year. It'll take a year to go through that book, but it's a dynamite, solid, good Catholic book. William Thomas Walsh was a solid Catholic. And, and many historians are warped and twisted and lie. But William Thomas Walsh was, was good and Catholic. He actually met Sister Lucia of Fatima. And he asked her, is, is the United States included under the, the scourge of communism? She said, yes. And we're actually more communist than Russia. Because Russia now bans, Putin bans pornography, bans the LGBTQ rainbow flag waver garbage. He won't allow their rainbow uh, processions. He won't allow any of their propaganda. He, he blocks all the Western garbage. So we're actually more atheist and more communist in the West and socialist, which is based on atheism, living as if there's no God. We're far worse, more rotten than, any, than anything in, in Russia right now. That's why Vladimir Lenin said, the West will fall in our hands like a ripe pear. And that's true. And remember, the essence of communism is atheism. When Pius XI condemned it, he says it's intrinsically evil because it's based on the denial of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So, by 1574, more Franciscans came in. By 1595, the Franciscan launched a large-scale concerted effort to win Florida's native population for the Catholic Church. So, 30 thriving missions by 1595. 30 thriving missions. By missions is meant where the priests establish an altar, a chapel, and the people live around that. So the center of their city is the Mass, the love of Christ, at which 26,000 Indians had been, had been taught the Catholic Catechism and the rudiments of uh, the European way of survival, working the land, fruit trees, taking care of animals, etc., the hardships they met and overcame in working this triumph beggar the imagination. One reason why their story is still so little known. So uh, another point to realize is how did the Catholic Spanish work in Florida, Georgia, North, North and South Carolina, and the other countries? How did they work compared to the Protestants? The Catholics moved in, settled, converted the Indians, and the Spaniards married them. They married them. So there was a whole new kind of race. And bringing them to Catholicism, it was a very calm, very peaceful, based on the charity of the Gospels, of the Sacred Heart of our Lord. Very, just, just very normal, we would say. But how did the Protestants, when they landed, in the north, the sides of the north. Where, what did they do? They killed off the Indians. They put them in reservations. And that's the Protestant style, just kill them off. And no history book reveals this fact. It's a fact. 
The Protestants just mowed them down, killed them off. And Father Desmet is a living proof of this. That's in the 1800s in the Northwest. He himself went to the Washington, D.C. and said, stop killing these people. They are converting. They're, they're, they have whole cities. They have whole tribes. Stop trying to kill them. And the Freemasons in Washington, D.C. said, oh, yes, with smiles and promises, treaties signed in handshakes, and they broke them all. And Father Desmet writes, and he says he saw whole tribes of thousands and thousands of Catholic Indians completely wiped out by the sword, by rifles, or by polio and disease. Because one of the things they would do is take off the clothing of a dead person from polio or a, a contagious disease, hang the clothes up near the trees of the Indian tribes, the Indians would be curious, put on the clothes, and the sickness would wipe out entire tribes of Indians. So Father DeSmet, this is a little insight into why we had the Civil War in the United States. Because Father DeSmet writes in July to, um, 1862, yes, 1862, he writes in a letter, God will punish this nation the leaders who will punish this country for wiping out whole Catholic nations of the converted Indians. And that literally happened within, the, that was 1862, by 1863, over 50,000 killed, American boys killed in Gettysburg, Antietam, Fredericksburg, and uh, Chickamauga. We're going to see Chickamauga and Lookout Mountain where the Civil War took place. So wars are punishments from God for sin. And Civil War was a punishment and it was a further punishment because the North won. And the North stood for the communist socialist way of life. While the South wasn't necessarily Catholic, but they stood for a more Catholic way of life. And Piacea Pope Pius IX in Rome sent several letters and a crown of thorns and a painting of St. Michael to President Jefferson Davis to show sympathy for the President of the South. So the South wasn't Catholic as such, but what they stood for was a more Catholic way of life. And being, if they seceded, they would have worked more, more with Mexico and probably would have become eventually a Catholic more Catholic nation. God knows. But wars are punishments from God for sin. So back to 1587. By 1587 the Franciscan friars were already becoming well established. Spain with, the, the, with Philip II was sending more missionaries, more soldiers, more support. And this is what one of the governors wrote to summarize all the great work. He said, Franciscan fathers, so you have come from the distant parts of the East to settle this poor and barren nest where the sun's fair face is hid. What humble, what humbly now I beg you all is to teach these Western tribes who look upon Satan as a friend, but their maker the true God they regard as a foe, as an enemy. So that's why the Indians were so savage, because they were given to the sat satanic worship. There were missions found on St. Simon Island, Jekyll Island, Cumberland Island, St. Catherine's Island, and the missionaries, uh, when they arrived, even the the governors of Spain and the soldiers would kneel down and kiss the hand of the priest. And the Indians seeing this, they, re they saw the respect due to what is of God. Now, we come to Father Pedro de Corpa. He's one of the, the next martyrs in line here. This is 1597. And there was an Indian convert his name was Juanillo, Juanillo. He became Catholic, but he wanted to keep his many wives. 
And Father de Corpa, Father Peter de Corpa, reprimanded him and said, No, God only allows one husband, one wife. You can't have many wives. So Juan Dio took this very personal and he, he became uh, revengeful. And he wouldn't change. So here's the recording of these great martyrs. Listen carefully. The results of this measure were not such as the two priests hoped for. On the morning of September 13, 1597, with two other Indians who were angered by the missionaries' attempt to keep the sacredness of marriage among the natives, Juanillo entered Father Corpa's dwelling where he was at prayer and fractured his head with a masana, an Indian club, like a tomahawk. <coughs> <coughs> the priest's head <clears throat> was impaled on the point of a lance and set up, set up for the gaze of all at the embarcadero, or the landing place. The remainder of the body was buried in the woods. The following day, Juanillo persuaded the chiefs of seven other villages to join him in a murderous campaign against the Franciscans. <clears throat> so this is happening now in Georgia with the Guale Indians. So this is Georgia. We're going to be right on the border of Georgia today. Tomorrow we're going to be in Georgia. The remainder of the body of Father de Corpa was thrown to the woods. The following day, Juanila persuaded the chiefs to begin a murderous campaign. On September 16, they accosted Father Rodriguez at, <coughs> at Tupiki and told him that he too would have to die. The priest asked the insurgents for time enough to offer a last mass, which he was allowed to do while the executioners sat waiting on the chapel floor. Following his mass, Father Rodriguez distributed his few belongings among the local Indians, admonished them to observe God's law, then he knelt down to receive the mortal blow. The Indians despoiled the priest's rooms of its sacred vessels and furnishings and left his corpse a prey to the birds and animals in the woods. Later, a Christian Indian took the body to the, wo to the woods and buried it. On St. Catherine's, or Huale, Island, Father Miguel de Anion and a lay brother, Antonio, patiently waited their own deaths. When scouts informed the missionaries that the rebel Indians were close by, Father Anion celebrated the Mass and gave Holy Communion to Brother Antonio. Then on September 19th, they too fell under the Masana, the Tomahawk. Faithful Christian Indians buried the remains as martyrs at the base of a towering wooden cross that Brother Antonio had erected on the island. A military expedition sent afterwards by Governor Gonzalo Mendez de Conzo exhumed the friars' bodies and brought them back to St. Augustine, where they were reburied with great reverence. So remember the cemetery at St. Augustine's the cemetery which used to be exposed, it used to have all the bones exposed, that's where they were reverently buried. So we prayed on that spot where these martyrs were buried. Another martyr was brother, Father Fray Francisco de Verascola. <clears throat> we'll call him Father Francisco. The missionary at Santo Domingo de Asao, known as the Catabrian giant for his large physical proportions. Father Verascola was in St. Augustine to obtain supplies when the rebellion broke out. On the day he returned, two of the rebels took him in their arms as if to welcome him, while the others killed him with an axe. A living martyrdom was the fate of Father Francisco de Avila at Ospo. He had already been apprised of the death of Father Corpa, when rebel Indians appeared one night outside the hut that served for his friary where the priest lived. The Indians tried to entice the priest out of the doors saying that they had a communication from his superior. 
When Father Avila refused to answer, the Indians broke in. The priest hid behind the door while the savages rummaged through his few possessions and then fled outside to the, the trees and, and bushes. The night was illuminated by a brilliant moon, however, and the priest was eventually sighted by the Indians, who wounded his shoulder, his hand, and thigh with a volley of arrows. The priest was then forced to walk to the village of Tulafina, a good distance away, where he was tortured and condemned to die. Finally, it was decided to spare his life in order for his services as a slave. So this is what happened also to St. Isaac Jogues in New York. In the winter, he, with his tattered cassock, they, he was a slave to the Indians. The priest then entered upon a horrible captivity lasting nine months. In great suffering from his wounds, he became the servant of everyone in the village, even of the children. He suffered from the cold and from constant hunger. All he had for food was what he could find himself among the wild produce of the Georgia coast. He had only scraps of cloth for clothes. And I remind you, the mosquitoes and the bugs there are, are like biblical proportions. So this priest lived a living martyrdom for all these months, but prayed and united it all with Christ crucified and for their, their conversion. The Indians attempted to make him enter a marriage contract and do other acts in violation of his vows of chastity or of holy religion. Finally, on June, in June 1598, he was freed by a Spanish military patrol and taken to St. Augustine where food and medicines restored his health. Father Avila was the only survivor among the friars who knew anything about the causes behind the Guale revolt. When the governor, Conzo, therefore asked him to testify on the matter, Father Avila refused and invoked the immunity granted to clerics. He argued that he could offer no evidence without incriminating the Indians and thereby, thereby leading to their execution, and that church law forbade him to do so. The governor acknowledged his immunity and left him in peace. Years later, Father Avila went to Havana, Georgia, where under Franciscan obedience, he wrote the account of his capture and captivity that we relate here. So 17 martyrs of Florida by, by 1597. 17 martyrs and then the new ones in Georgia. So we're going to go today and pray at one of Father uh, Martinez's martyrdom site. So let's pray to these martyrs, the soil soaked in so much blood, and ask that spirit of the martyrs, a strong faith that doesn't compromise, and a great love for the Virgin Mary. O Mary conceived without sin, O Mary conceived without sin, O Mary conceived without sin. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.